presented by Revolution Radio, broadcasting live from the Roanoke Valley of southwestern Virginia. Join us and see what life looks like from a medium's perspective with Reverend Tracy Lockwood, the medium's medium. We'll explore the tools of psychic development, hear stories and experiences from the other side, and learn to listen to our natural intuition. Now, our host, Reverend Tracy Lockwood. Hello, beautiful lights, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. Today, I'm going to be talking with you about recurrent dreams. What are they? What's the purpose of them? And we'll be taking a look into the dream state at a deeper level. But before we go too deep in today's show, I'd like to mention that my very first professional psychic mediumship certification program debuts 2017. It's a 14-week immersion program. It will give you a substantial amount of practice giving readings and using about every technique available. We will be doing readings beginning with the body basics and then the left brain tools and on to those that are used for psychic readings. We're going to go into mediumship exercises and you'll get an introduction to channeling and a chance to deepen your abilities in that arena. For those of you that plan a career in psychic mediumship, this course is for you. It includes business tips and a wealth of information. If you are just learning to use your abilities and would like a comprehensive, structured program to develop your gifts within, this program is for you. It is designed for individuals at all levels of practice, and there's more information about it on my website at Medium. TracyLockwood.com. There's a video talking about it on my YouTube channel about the certification program. It's under the Hardcore Mediumship series. So what's up with recurring dreams? Before we get into the specifics, I'd like to talk to you about what dreams usually are. Being in the dream state is being as close to our being out of body as we regularly get in the physical realm. Of course, if you meditate or have a psychic development practice, you spend a little more time out of body. We are attached to the different planes of existence by cords of light that connect our many bodies to each other. And as we expand and radiate out along the ray of light that we, as beautiful lights of the divine, are, our outermost body becomes the physical one. Abraham Hicks refers to our physical bodies being the leading edge of divine self-expression. That's pretty cool, right? And our physical body is attached to our etheric body. It's the etheric body that serves as the communication between us and the other unseen, higher vibrational worlds of subtle energy and spirit. You know from our previous episodes that the etheric body has two parts, the first is the etheric double, which is almost a copy of what we look like in the physical, but without impediment. It extends maybe an inch beyond the surface of our skin, and it provides the framework for subtle energies and is the framework on which the material body is built. It contains a series of channels called meridians and energy centers called chakras. That's our etheric double. The second part of the etheric body is our aura, and it's been seen as an egg-shaped field of energy that surrounds the etheric double. I actually see its outermost expression like a torus, you know, that tire shape where energies enter and exit. The aura extends about three feet from the physical body when it's at rest and expands to fill universes and infinite space when we work in spirit or reach out to those that are on the other side, or it can contract and condense our energies around our body for protection should the need arise. The etheric body as a whole serves as our interface between the two worlds, the link between states of being. 
using our mind or subconscious as opposed to our brain or analytical thinking, we can use our mind to access these amazing other dimensions and we can perceive activity and the inhabitants of the subtler realms. And it's pretty wild to think that we do that every time that we sleep. While we sleep, our left brain is resting because it's tired from its use during the day, worrying about problems, thinking of great ideas, and it also physiologically functions as the neural center of the body. But our mind, which is our subconscious awareness, is eternal and it never sleeps. Our mind actually has nothing to do while the body and brain recharge themselves during our sleep, so it travels. And boy, oh boy, does it travel. We travel to the astral realm and beyond. And with our etheric body, we carry with us our essence, our intellect, our emotions, imagination, our will, and memory. It's basically our consciousness, and it's imprinted with our current personality. So where do we go while we sleep? The answer really isn't as simple as you might think. While our brain is organizing and filing the data from the day and making associations to try to make sense of the insanities of the day or to acclimate to the miracles and happy things that have occurred, our etheric body is busy, busy, busy. Without the impediment of a heavy physical body, the etheric body is able to rise to higher vibrational planes. And it's there that we receive insight and assistance from our guides. We visit with those that we love on the other side. We return home to the higher realms that we originated from so that we can relax and hang out with others in our natural non-physical state. We can access wisdom from the mental plane in the halls of learning or other epic places. Sometimes when we're in the sleep state, we even serve as facilitators and guides to others here in the physical world or that are here in the physical world and we can visit those that we love here on earth that we might be separated from or that we need to communicate with at a higher level. We can join with members of our soul group to discuss the next events that will occur for us in this life. Or we might even continue our soul's mission in any of the planes. It's a great place to meet your guides and angels. Your vibration is already higher when you're sleeping and it makes it easier for them to communicate with you. When we're asleep, our mind consciousness really has nothing better to do than watch ourselves sleep. And because that's kind of boring, it allows us the freedom of visiting these other realms. I had an interesting occurrence a few years ago. My daughter Kelly and son Eric hadn't spoken to me for quite a while. I think it was bumping three years. Long story. But the shorter version is that the day that I released them to the highest good and removed my need to try to control the outcome of the situation, the very next day my daughter texted me after three years of no contact. And we began to reconnect. To my great joy, each day brings us closer together. However, here's the interesting part. After Kelly and I had been talking for a couple of months, after that monumental day that she texted me, she asked, Mom, do you know why I texted you that day? And I said, no, Kelly, I don't. And she said, well, the night before, you were in my room and your arms were wide open and I felt so much love. I just had to see if it was real. I know, right? So the day I let go of her, that night, my etheric body physically appeared in her room and my release of the situation and the love were visible to her. That's pretty wild, pretty wild, but true. That's just one example of what we can do in our sleep state. And yes, it is real. So maybe you're wondering if you saw your grandma or mom or dad or child or any loved one in your dreams, is that real? 
And I have to say, oh yes, indeedy, it's real. While our left brain, our critical analytical thinking part of us is sleeping, our intuitive and perceptive subconscious part of us is freer and less restricted because the left brain can't tell us to doubt what we're experiencing. So like those that are trained in meditation or psychic development in the dream state, you are freely able to perceive and experience the energies of those that have passed. Right there, you're functioning as a medium. Every night you dream, anytime you connect with those in spirit. And it wasn't even on your agenda, <laughs> other than you might have set your intent at some point to visit them in your dreams. Dreams encrypt our experiences. They're like a code that keeps the integrity of our dream state in a form that we can recall. The symbols are keys to the fuller story. They can help us not only recall our dream and experiences, but further understand them with our left brain in our awake awareness. Symbols are like the shorthand of messages from the other side. The images and storyline help us access the information through this encoding to help us recall and remember our out-of-body subconscious experiences. The same thing occurs for psychics and mediums. We might not always remember what we receive in a reading because we're in a state of mind similar to the waking dream state in the places that we go that place between sleep and wake in the realm of our subconscious mind. I have a good example for you. One of my youngest clients right now is seven years old. She lost her mother and great grandmother within three months of each other. And her grandmother is now caring for her. And she's been coming to me for the medium's equivalent of grief counseling to visit with her mom and great grandmother so that she is better able to cope with her loss. And in the second section, she asked her mom, who's on the other side, why she didn't visit her in her dreams or give her signs that she was around. And her mom answered that she didn't know how yet, but that she would practice and she would learn how. A few weeks later, the grandmother called me and said that she had had a dream my client, the young girl, had had a dream about her mom and that it had left her very depressed and could I help? So we set another appointment. A little ways into the session, I said, I heard you had a dream and you saw your mom. Will you want to tell me about that? And she shared that in her dream, she was at home and that the doorbell rang. Her grandmother went to open the door and her mom was standing there. My client said that she was so surprised because she thought her mom had died, but she was so happy to see her. Her mom came in the room and gave her a really big hug. My client said that she could feel it and that it felt very real. And then her mom gave her a cell phone and it was the latest technology. She was really excited, but when she woke up, she looked for the phone and it wasn't there and she felt sad that her mom wasn't alive and with her. With the help of her mom's energy during the reading, I was able to explain to her that her grandmother in the dream had in this world opened the door to her being able to see her mom by bringing her to me. I was the door. And that her mom had promised to come to her in her dreams and she had and that her mom also promised to try to give her a hug, and she did. And I confirmed with her that it had been a great hug, very real. I explained to her that because her mom wasn't in her physical body, that was the best thing that she could do. I explained that the phone that she had given her in the dream was a way for her to talk directly to her mom, and that she could do this with her mind, and her mom would answer her. After that, my client had a really improved state of mind. She had a great deal of peace. She became really happy and she started drawing pictures. And she drew a picture of the energy that she saw around me. It was every color that I had in the mug of crayons. And then she wrote in gray, Tracy Lockwood is awesome and amazing. <laughs> Best praise I ever got. And I love the fact that she chose gray for the color because 
Gray is neither black or white, neither physical or non-physical. It's a neutral in-between color, really perfect for a medium. <laughs> so you see, our dream state is just an altered state that is real. But of course, that brings to question, what about nightmares? Nightmares are negative experiences and therefore are related to the lower vibrational energies. Not that we are lower vibrational or not beings of light, but because we're in a physical body, the next layer of beings that's closest to us when we're out of body are the lowest vibrational energies out there besides the creepers in this life, of course. So when we have a nightmare, we can be wrestling with lower vibrational beings while we're out of body. And you add that to our brain that is processing negative experiences while we're coming into the physical world or recalling past lives and the traumas that were associated with that. It can kind of be scary. But sometimes with a scary dream, our oversoul or guides are giving us information to help us put into place things that we can't comprehend in the physical world. For example, I was in the midst of a very traumatic custody battle that lasted 10 years, and this was at the beginning. It was less than a year in. I had a dream that really disturbed me. I was sort of in a dark void. These higher beings handed me a severed hand, and I knew it to be the severed hand of my then ex-husband. And I woke up, and it was just so so creepy. It was like, oh, my God, people that dream about body parts or necrophiliacs, and I do not want to have sex with dead bodies. And I just was flipped out, and I didn't want to talk about it to anyone because it was such a weird dream, and I was terrified what it signified. I just didn't know. It just was freaky. But I talked about it eventually with my best friend at the time. And she said, Tracy, where were you living before you moved back to the U.S.? And I said, Saudi Arabia. And she said, and what is the punishment for stealing something that isn't yours in Saudi Arabia? And I said, oh, cutting off the hand. And she said, duh. And she said, and what did your ex-husband do, which was to take custody of children in a brutal and unloving way. And I understood up until that time, I had really, 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 really wanted to kill him. I was so mad and I was so protective of my children. I didn't really like plot it out or anything, but I just had like this fantasy of like knifing him in the chest and kicking him over a cliff and I don't know where that cliff would have been, but, you know, walking on without a conscience. And after that dream, I was able completely to release my need for vengeance. And I didn't have that feeling or emotion anymore because I realized that there is a system of justice at some point. He will understand what he has done and that it's not my job to ensure that that justice occurs. And I was able to let go of it and move on in a much more happy way in my own life. So dreams can reveal to us things that our waking brain might not accept. They can be precognitive, tell us things that are about to happen. Because when we're out of body, we see time and space from a different perspective, and the future is clearer to us. The thing you need to be aware of is that just because you see something in the future doesn't mean that you're responsible for it happening or that you're responsible for telling the person that it's about. Sometimes people worry, should I have told them or did I make it happen? And that's absolutely not true. Sometimes it's just a perception that's given to you so that you develop trust in your experiences and that you're able to hear more clearly the messages from the subtle realm of spirit or your subconscious. Sometimes they're given to you to help help you prepare for a future occurrence so that it won't be as traumatic to you if it occurs in the physical. I've had several dreams and visions about my mom's future passing. She's still alive. Just had a visit with her yesterday. I've dreamt about 
her surprise and pleasure about finding me in the astral realm, about being greeted as she crossed over by her dog, Cindy. I had a series of dreams that initially disturbed till I thought about their meaning, and it was the process of going through her life review before even her time, which was so interesting to me because I'd never really thought about I know that not everybody goes through their life review upon passing, and sometimes it's centuries out, or sometimes it's fairly immediate, but I never had thought about it being before we pass as a possibility. I feel like I've been sensing that the time's near, not to frighten me, but to prepare me, because I really love her so much, and our relationship has changed so much in the last few years that I treasure my time with her. We're definitely soulmates and here to teach each other soul level lessons, you know, how to move past pain into love or that love has many expressions and we don't always resonate with that expression that the person tries to emit. That the human experience of life in the physical affects all of us and that we're much more alike than we imagine and that we're not perfect but that we can see each other's perfect souls within each other's eyes and that we need each other that both that we're both loving and lovable each day is more precious than the day before for me and with her and onwards and upwards and I know that my love and her love will continue when it's her time and that our reunion will be a happy one when it's my time I had two guides appear to me that way and you might wonder well Tracy you know you're a professional medium, why would you have a problem meeting a guide, especially because I know over 20 of mine by name and purpose and language, so why would I have trouble with meeting another one? Well, in this case, it was because in my waking mind, I have a discomfort with thinking about aliens, you know, people from other planets, and so much so that I call them star people to refer to their place of origin because I like that term better. But a few months ago, I had a dream and I met two more of my guides. I was walking down a path in the dream and I was in the mountains. And as I looked down the path, I saw a baby bear, which in my dreams symbolizes blockages or fears that I might have. And I saw the baby bear and I thought, oh no, if that baby bear is there, there's going to be a mother bear near and I need to get away. So I started scaling the mountain to the right of me and going up to a higher path. And as I did, the bears started to come to me. But then this little guy who was very odd looking, he was short, maybe four foot something. He had really white skin and I mean like paper white and his hair was coiffed in this very geometric curl shape, and he had just the most beautiful eyes, and even though he kind of looked like a cherub in the sense that he was dressed in one of those white wrap things between the legs like you see cherubs wearing, he was definitely a full-grown male, but his legs were much shorter than someone that's built in the same way that I am, and he had a companion too that came up the mountain behind him and as that mother bear approached and the other bears started to come toward me he stood up and walked toward them very calmly and they completely turned around and ran the other direction and I asked them what their names were and their names were Remus and Rondel both starting with an RH And I just found that very interesting. And it took me a while and a conversation with another medium to figure out that they were possibly a hybrid being, but definitely someone that could have come from another star system and or combined with angelic heritage. So, so, you know, sometimes we just don't feel comfortable with the information or maybe in the case of grief, we're, we're missing somebody so much we can't connect with their happier state of being, this can all lead to needing to do that in the dream state. You know, sometimes we can't recall our dreams, and that's okay too, just like we can't always recall our past lives because it would just be TMI. 
Sometimes we're not intended to recall our dreams, but the ones that we do recall are significant and they're laden with symbolism and emotions that give us kind of a mystery trail to sort and decrypt. Now back to our show from a medium's perspective with host, Reverend Tracy Lockwood. Welcome back. We are talking about recurring dreams and their connection with past lives. So what about recurring dreams? That's really where it gets interesting because recurring dreams can relate to recurring lives, past lives. They can be the remnants of past lives. We can remember their fears and some of the beauties and strengths that we had, beautiful experiences and strengths that we had in those lives. And they can be lessons of those lives that breach into our awareness in this life and help us realize that when we're on our soul's journey, it's a bigger process than us. And they can remind us that we're far more than our present physical body and life experience. I've had a few recurring dreams. One of them was being terrorized by pterodactyls. I just have this morbid fear of pterodactyls, or did. I don't think I really think about it anymore. But when I was younger, over and over, I would dream about being attacked by pterodactyls. And you cannot even imagine my confusion when I later learned that humans didn't exist when pterodactyls dominated the skies. I was just really confused because of the dreams and the sense of memory that they provoked. They were full-on recurrent dreams that seemed extremely real to me. I just couldn't understand why I would be dreaming about them until now. Like now, I know that our incarnations coming to Earth or to other places in a physical state, we can come as non-human things too. We can come as plants or animals or other beings. We can even come as mythical creatures or beings from other star systems, ancient cultures that are thought at one time to be mythical, like Atlantis. Basically, all life is sentient, and each experience gives us a different perspective. Our recurrent dream state can also give us insight into the larger picture, the one that's connected to our soul's journey. Symbols vary person to person, so If you're looking at books on dream symbology, I don't know, for me, they don't really resonate. I kind of become irritated with most of them because they're just a little too neat and tidy and they don't necessarily resonate or match up with my experiences. And I feel like sometimes their meaning or interpretation can be misleading. I know that they're archetypes and I know that dreams have been diagnosed by psychologists, etc., etc., but they can be not what your dream is about. For instance, for me, dogs in a dream mean trickery, not loyalty. I love dogs, so in this life, I don't have any problem with dogs. When I see dogs, I know to be on high alert because it means that there are people around me that are posing as friends but have impure motives. It's helped me on two or three occasions to be able to discern on the ground physical situation that was going on that I might have overlooked because I tend to see the best in people. Be sure that when you look at a dream interpretation book that the meaning resonates with you and gives you a sense of clarity and peace. It should fit. And if it doesn't, then just keep looking or keep searching inside yourself for the meaning or ask your guides and angels to bring the meaning to you or find someone that's gifted in that area of psychic mediumship. I really love to feel the meanings and interpret dreams for people. I had an interesting chance to interpret for a client the other day. He was having not only recurrent dreams, but sequential dreams. You know, one that evolved into another. It was like a a series, he said. It was making him really fearful because they were not pretty. There was body parts being blown to bits in the Middle East, and there were people stalking and beating people up in a nightmarish situation and all kinds of things. And when the interpretation came, his understanding increased, and he found peace not only in this life, but had a larger perspective on his physical life. 
as well as a sense of accomplishment at a soul level because they were very deep dreams, actually. They incorporated his soul journey. They incorporated past life memories. They incorporated a lot of things that wove together. But once he saw it from the perspective of the interpretation, it, it really made him feel better. There's a website called healpastlives.com. They have this really cool breakdown or look at what dreams are used for. Their premise is, as mine is, that they are there to work through past life karma. They said that why the dream is there depends on your level of spiritual evolution. And I hadn't really thought about it from that angle before, but they said if you're just getting into greater awareness of your spirituality, then karmic dreams is the way they call them, are a safe way of introducing you to the greater totality of yourself, to your past lives. In other words, you can relive a traumatic past life event, even if your waking belief system doesn't support the belief in past lives. And I found that interesting. So you could be working through your karma in your dreams to try to smooth and assimilate and connect experiences that you've had before with this one or even subconsciously. And they say that if you're already on the path, that karmic dreams are a more harmonious way to work off your karma. In other words, if you have a past life robbery karma to work off, then experiencing getting your house vandalized in the dream state is a much less disruptive one than if it had actually happened to you in real life. So sometimes you can play out scenarios that help you, uh, just like we come into the physical world to play out uh, different adventures and scenarios so that we gain perspective, you can be doing that in the dream state. And they're saying that that's something that someone who's opened spiritually can work through and benefit from. They say to remember that karma is more about teaching than punishing. And that if you can learn the lessons less painfully in the dream state, that's the surest sign of the working of a loving and compassionate universe. And they point out that past life dreams have a historical detail. They have events that don't change. And those events are in a sequence that these events are outside of your learning or experience, and they might correspond to strange beliefs, like either religious beliefs or beliefs in things that go outside your human thought process at the time. And they can explain some of your unusual behaviors or preferences or gifts. Past life dreams also correspond to strange habits uh, maybe not wanting to wear something tight around your neck or hating to have rings on your fingers. They can go back to those reasons. Past life dreams can also lead to an understanding of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual issues. So I just want to thank HealPastLives.com for that insight. I thought that was pretty cool. Dream interpretation is one of the spiritual gifts that's mentioned in the Bible. Daniel, a later King Daniel, was really good at it. And I really love the account that's recorded there. And I'm going to share it here, but I want to state that it is not with the intent of advocating that the Bible or the Christian religion are the only way to view the divine. I love Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim and other great religious traditions. Ramakrishna said that, Religions are like the lenses of cameras taking pictures of the same building from different angles. And I really agree with that viewpoint, but I wanted to share this because it was pertinent to what we're talking about today. And this is taken from uh, the Bible, from Daniel chapter 2. It's the New International Version, and it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams his mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. 
Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. Well, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel, who was one of the wise men, spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he may interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends. He urged them to plead for the mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream? and interpret it. And Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty might know the interpretation and that you might understand what went on through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in its appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue A rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. And I have to say, hua, bold, because he, you know, wasn't getting a lot of feedback from the king up till that point. So you got to go with your gut and keep rolling when you're doing a reading. Anyway, uh, so he says, your majesty, you are king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. And after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And of course, you know world history, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, right? And as the iron breaks things to pieces, so will it crush and break all other things. 
just as you saw that the feet and toes of partially baked, baked clay and partly iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some strength of iron in it, even as you saw the iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set upon a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Daniel was a superlative interpreter. Interpreter. And the understanding of a dream can really bring peace to someone once its symbols are understood. And so can readings. And so as you are discerning the information that comes to you as you move forward in your practice of reading, you have to realize that there are things that are not comprehensible to our left brain. King Nebuchadnezzar was thinking with his left brain, the whole statue thing just completely had him befuddled and scared. But when Daniel was able to interpret that dream for him, all the pieces started to fall in place. And as you're doing your readings, they may not be as grand as Daniel. He had needed to take time to get the meaning of the dream, to get the sense of what had been dreamed about, and then to understand its interpretation. So in a typical reading, you probably would just share your dream with the reader and let them interpret it or put it down in front of yourself and see if you can find the root of those symbols and meanings of images within that. You need to just let your mind free when you do that without any preconceived idea. And the pieces that come to you that seem random, that seem impossible, that seem like they don't really make sense, you're just sensing them, those are generally the proof and the evidence that are necessary in order to prove the information or to give the answers to that person that you're reading for or to yourself. We talked in the last episode, Jamie Butler, and we were talking about the difference between imagination and inspiration. How do you differentiate the two? And, and you know, I often think that our imagination is the portal to the other side. So don't be afraid to use your imagination because it is the key to the subconscious. Well, we're already at time, and I just want to thank you for joining us. I want to remind you that it's never inappropriate to be kind, and without integrity, you have nothing. Thank you for joining us.